roller coaster. Uh, make sure you button down. Uh, Davi is the founder director, a founder director and chief economist of the Efficient Group. Uh, he's a nationally renowned economist with 30 years of experience, specializes in what he's talking about today, monetary and fiscal policy, and uh, uh, he's directly involved in the management of client asset portfolios. So he better get it right. Uh, Davi is one of the most referenced economists in the South African media and has been the anchor presenter of a very popular program for those familiar with Afrikaans TV, Ont Baitsaka, for 12 years, of which I've been a guest. And it's uh, for those who are happy with Afrikaans, well worth going to Ont Baitsaka. Uh, Davi, uh, we look forward to this. The, um, the, uh, the new uh, Tito era, and Davi is going to talk to us about where we are and where we're going, and I'm looking forward to that, as I'm sure you are. When he's done, Davi is always willing to, ans to take questions. He's not always willing to answer them, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> Davi, over to you. Thank you. Bye, Don Leon. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, always nice being at, at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, I'm always a little bit nervous at the Free Market Foundation. I don't know why. Really, I am. Okay, my, my, my talk tonight is, uh, is actually not going to be about the budget. The budget is sort of going to be the tail end of the, the, the talk. I don't really get into the numbers that much anymore. I've got people doing that. Now I'm trying to look at other stuff. And, uh, and some international developments and, and getting, trying to get a little bit more into politics and so on. But I, I, have, I do have some numbers that I would like to share with you. But before I get to that, maybe just one or two comments. And um, Leon and I, we've just been talking about um, the, the comments about uh, what is the economy and what's included in the economy. And can you remember the markets, that amorphous entity? And for some weird reason, politicians keep on talking about the markets. It's some, some organism somewhere. It's not. It's just us. That's the market. So you can't. It's just us. What's so? What's what's that difficult to understand about the markets? The second thing. Um, a, a previous talks when I was doing uh, when I analysed the, the state finances as an example, we were looking at the different taxes and so on. And I'm sure you will. And that's the wonderful thing about being an economist. You can keep on changing your mind, and you can always learn new things. And I've learned something really important. I think until I find something more important. But I guess the, the single biggest invention ever or discovery ever was trade, to trade with one another. That is the biggest economic discovery ever. Because when two individuals trade, they both win. Maybe later on you will realize somebody sold you something that you can get somewhere else but cheaper. But that moment, both individuals are better off. Because I will not trade with you something if I don't think I am going to somehow gain out of this specific transaction. Exactly the same on your side. And if you look what's been happening over the millennia, uh, the basic thing, the reason why we became as wealthy and successful is because we reduced the cost of trade. We've reduced transaction costs over time. And transaction costs, of course, can be reduced by introducing something that we call money. And money has been evolving over time. And today we've got cryptocurrencies or electronic money, and I've had a talk about that and so on. And that is going to boost economic growth even further because it reduces transaction costs. And in previous talks, I said that they are always, taxes are always bad. But one tax that is perhaps a little bit less bad than other taxes may be value-added tax. I am not so sure anymore because value-added tax essentially is an obstacle to trade. And so maybe it's not a good idea. And that was my default position. And that's what I've been taught always. That is always good. Well, not always good, but if you want to increase something, rather make use of indirect taxes. So I must tell you, I am a little bit confused. But what I have learned is that without a doubt, the reduction in transaction costs is something that is part of the reason why we have been so successful the past 100 years. Now, if you go back 100 years, as an example, more than 90% of humans lived in abject poverty. 
And today it is less than 10% of people that live in abject poverty. More than 50% of the world's population today are actually in the middle classes, depending how you define that, of course. Uh, so most of us are part of the middle class. That is astonishing. That is absolutely amazing. A hundred years ago, uh, very few people lived longer than, say, 45 years. I'm talking about European countries. Today, life expectancy is about 80 years and rising in the rich countries in the world. And we did this in a relatively short period of time. This was really an go a golden uh, century for humankind. And it, it just imagine in 10 years or 20 years, we won't have poverty anymore. Maybe one or two places and places like, for example, Africa. We have really have made amazing progress. We don't always see that because in the short term, there's a lot of noise like what we're currently experiencing in South Africa. But over time, without a doubt, we are making a lot of progress. I think and there are many reasons why we made this progress. And I think much of that started after the Second World War when we decided to... to to live life according to a certain set of rules. Things like, for example, institutions that we've created, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and uh, the Parliament of the World, United, you know, United Nations. And we also created the world currency. The gold standard was nothing but a, go a world. And we also created institutions like the World Trade Organization, making it easier for countries to trade. And that resulted in this absolute explosion of wealth creation. Of course, there were some demographic reasons behind that. And I would argue one of the most important demographic reasons behind that, and I've had to talk about that as well, is because we started sending girls to school. And the impact that has on, on demographics, but on economic performance as well. Gradually over time, I think that agreement that we entered into after the Second World War is slowly coming to an end. It started... I guess, in 1971 when Richard Nixon said that we're not going to make use of the gold standard anymore. And also maybe just going back to just after the Second World War, we created central banks. There were very few central banks actually. Most central banks are less than 100 years old. There were one or two old ones, but most central banks were created relatively recently. But in 1971, Richard Nixon, we stepped off the gold standard and we moved to another money standard and that's the dollar standard. And remember, if you, if you make use of somebody else's money, you essentially and indirectly pay them a tax. So it was, the, it was certainly the golden era for the American economy, and that's part of the reason why the American economy is so big. But gradually over time is that the original idea of individuals being at the center of the universe, that has changed. And today we've got somebody else in the center of the universe. We've got a new uber class, a new ruling class, and they are the career politicians and the career bureaucrats and the career bankers, central bankers specifically. Because governments have become so big, governments have increased the tax burdens to such an extent, they've been borrowing money to such an extent that the debt burden globally today is the highest it has ever, ever been. Central banks have become immensely powerful. Central banks are responsible just about for everything. Uh, and and, they are, and that's, uh, there are two major threats, I guess, in the world at the moment. The one has to do with... Um, with uh, the, the, the trade war between Trump and the rest. Um, I'm not too concerned about that because I think eventually sanity will prevail. And also I do think Trump is probably going to win most of these uh, wars. And the simple reason for that is because the US economy is a very, very big economy and is relatively closed. While the rest of the world, are, of course, most of them are much smaller and they're all relatively open. So Trump certainly has got a sort of a head start, a start as when it comes to the trade war. So I think the sanity will prevail mostly, and I, I'm not too concerned about the so-called trade war. What I am concerned about a little bit is that the Federal Reserve, especially, but some of the other central banks in the world, may just get their timing wrong. And they may just increase interest rates by too much. The central banks, the past 10 years, as we all know, they've reduced interest rates to ridiculously low levels, even below zero. We've never seen this. And they've printed, printed money, made money out of nothing, call it quantitative easing. So get used to another word, quantitative tightening. And there are many examples uh, in the past where, where, the, where central banks got it wrong, tightened monetary policy too quickly. And in fact, that is part of the reason why we've seen the financial markets reacting the way they have the last couple of, of weeks and months and so on. Um, and I'm a bit concerned that if there's the, they, they, do, they tighten too quickly, then we could see the financial markets and of course the world economy being affected by that. But I think more importantly is that we're also seeing, or equally importantly, we're seeing some a political fallout because of the developments, economic developments and the change in the way that the world is governed. Uh, and people are getting sick and tired of this. 
the original idea of the individual being the center of the universe that has changed and that's part of the reason why we saw Brexit, why we saw what is happening in Italy. People are voting against the status quo, what we saw in Catalonia and many other examples and that's also part of the reason why, I saw, why we saw this phenomenon called Donald Trump. Um, maybe just one or two, so, so expect, in uh, South America that's another example just recently, Brazil. Um, so expect that probably to continue more a new form of nationalism, nationalism globally and whatever is going to come because of that. Maybe just one or two countries in the world, the U US economy as we all know is just uh, roaring ahead. The US economy is growing very, very fast. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. A very important short-term reason has to do with cut, tax cuts in the US economy. They're probably going to keep on growing quite strongly for some time at least but eventually their debt overhang will catch up with them. Uh, the main benefit of being America is that the rest of the world is using your currency. Some other economies, the Japanese economy, will probably keep on growing quite slowly, which is not necessarily a bad thing because you have to adjust for the fact that the population is also contracting. So on a per capita basis, they're actually doing not too badly. And if you look at the technological advances in countries like the US, but also in places like Japan, productivity is really going up quite sharply in places like Japan. We like to invest in countries like, for example, Japan, not because of the Japanese story, but because Japan is doing a lot of business with all these other economies like the, the Chinese and the Indians and so on. Uh, the Chinese economy is slowing down and is likely to continue to slow down. There's a lot of debt, but we're not really sure how much in China because of the way they report things. Um, and that's something, that's something positive of having a centrally controlled or a communist kind of government because all you simply have to do is simply rule by decree and say, listen, you are not allowed to sell something or we simply close the markets, for example. So I guess there could be something uh, to be said for, for centrally controlled economies. The economy that I really do like is the Indians. I think the eco Indian economy is going to roar ahead. That is the economy that's got the potential to pull the world economy along. South America is dead in the water. Let's see what's going to happen to Brazil now. Uh, the Russians are dead in the water. I was there not too long ago, and it's not a rumor. They really do drink a lot. And, uh, and the life expectancy of men, Russian men, is someone 55 years or so because of drinking. The interesting thing about the Russians, that is, um, that is one of the economies where the uh, population growth is actually contracting before they became wealthy. Another economy that's going to follow the same pattern is the Chinese. Usually what happens, you get wealthy and then population goes down. But in the case of the Chinese, they probably population growth is going to slow down or pop the population is going to get smaller before they got wealthy. The European economies are not going to grow. doesn't mean necessarily it's bad news because of the, the, the small, exactly the same sort of story as, in, uh, as in, in Japan. But I'm a little bit concerned about the European experiment. I'm not so sure it's going to work. Okay, coming to South Africa and maybe one or two comments about politics in South Africa. Uh, the South African government, the ANC-led South African government, is probably the most destructive force that we have ever seen in the history of South Africa. And I'm going to show you some numbers, why I say so. And people say that we only have to wait until the next election for the good uh, wing of the ANC uh, to, to, to consolidate their political power and they will start doing good things. I'm not really so sure about that because looking at the good wing of the of the ANC, they were also the guys that voted in favor, uh, well, voted for uh, Zuma uh, during the votes of no confidence. They were also the guys defending Kantla, for example, our president included, and many other examples um, of that. And the reason why they did that, the argument behind this is that it's better to stay in the ANC to make sure that you consolidate the ANC, and once you've consolidated the ANC, then you can take the next step and start doing the right things for the country. I simply don't buy that. Uh, if you are in a responsible position, like a political leader or a minister or something you do, the first, your first priority must be to do the right thing for your country and not for, for your political party. So that is a bit of an issue for me. Um, anyway, it's most of the same guys are there, and the problem is not, it's not cabinet necessarily, although there are many problems there. The problem, is, the problem is actually all over. It's everywhere, and I cannot think of one single thing in South Africa for which government is responsible for that works well. I cannot think of one single thing. If somebody can help me and tell me of one single thing that works well, tell me about that, please, that the ANC government is responsible for. Uh, don't tell me it's South African Reserve Bank, they work relatively well, they are independent and still they are, and I think they're doing a fairly good job. Um, 
Then uh, we all know that one of the major issues, and I'll show you some numbers on that, is that we have civil servants that are hopelessly overpaid and that uh, the new Minister of Finance, which by the way I think is the best that the ANC can offer, it's not necessarily the best, but it certainly is the best that the ANC can offer. It's a bit of a maverick and I think it's going to ch change, turn things around. And I think the biggest advantage of having Titu Mbaweni as a new Minister of Finance is that he hasn't got a political history. He's not tainted really. So I think that is the biggest plus there. But he's got the experience of having been the Reserve Bank, the governor at the South African Reserve Bank. I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but at least he knows a lot of people. Uh, and I, I guess that, that could be a positive there as well. Um, but uh, something that people, I haven't seen the newspapers writing about this, one of the first things that Cyril Ramaphosa did was to replace um, the boards of the state-owned enterprises, which of course was the right thing to do, and they replaced the board of Eskom as an example with a quite reputable, good board. I'm happy with the board at Eskom. And they did the right thing when uh, there was demands for wage increases uh, soon after they were appointed as members uh, or the new board at Eskom, uh, demands for wage increases and uh, they said, doing the right thing, they said no, a 0% increase for people working at ESCOM. Which of course was the right thing because ESCOM workers are completely overpaid and all those numbers that you all know better than me probably. And uh, immediately what happened, our new Minister of State on Enterprises, Pravin Gordon, and I'm sure that was under instructions from the President, simply overruled the new board and eventually there was an increase of 7.5% wages for um, ESCOM and plus bonuses. And, because the guys burnt down, they destroyed well, they had the, the infrastructure and we had blackouts and stuff like that. So that is not, I can't see how the, the new um, uh, minister or how the new presidency is going to tackle those the most important issue. And that is to reduce the amounts of money that we spent on the civil service, including things like, for example, ESCOM. So I am very concerned about South Africa and what is going to happen in South Africa. There are a couple of things that I think we, we have to look at things in slightly perhaps a little bit different. As an asset manager, there are two things that are important to me. The one is what sort of returns I'm going to get in an investment. And the other one, of course, is the risk that I'm taking an, in an investment. My clients always want a lot of returns for the managed money that I manage for them, but they do not want to take risk. And uh, whenever they, they want to take better, get better returns, I tell them that it's inevitable, you have to take higher risk as well. And maybe we should look at South Africa slightly differently and say that we all know that we have a lot of risk in South Africa. You all know what those risks are, and that must suggest that there must be a lot of returns somewhere in the economy as well, in the country as well. And I, um, and, uh, and I know many business people and they are hugely successful in the country, despite all these risks. And I think they are usually successful because of two reasons. They can identify their risks and they can manage those risks. So if you can identify, whatever you do, if you can identify the risks in your industry or in your business and you can manage those risks, it's pretty much a given that you will be making a lot of money. On a medium longer term, I don't know what's going to happen to South Africa. The numbers look absolutely horrible. And what I'm also concerned about is that um, I have been approached by a number of um, organizations from, from the Western Cape, two, of, two different organizations from the Western Cape. They want to secede from the rest of South Africa. They want me to do a lot of numbers to see if that is possible. I have been approached by people from KZN. Um, I have been approached from the King of Swaziland to help them. Not, of course, they're not part of South Africa, I realize that, but they want to get less, they want to be less dependent on South Africa. So I'm, I'm concerned about this experiment called South Africa that started in 1910, and I am 100% convinced that it is going to survive politically. Okay, that is a bit of a background, and now let's have a look at the, the budget, or the so-called mini budget. Keep in mind that this is not a budget. This is an opportunity for the Minister of Finance just to report back on what's been happening in the South African economy and also to report back what's been happening on state finances, on the numbers on state finances. And of course, uh, everybody said, but can, you, know, you can't expect anything to happen because that's not his job. He's not, he, he, the, his job to change policy will happen in February. So wait for February and see what the Minister of Finance is going to do then because that's the platform to change policy. And he's been there only for two weeks when he delivered his so-called mini-budget speech. So, uh, yeah, anyway, you did make a couple of announcements. Maybe there's one comment he announced, uh, three items that, I, if you can remember correctly, that will be zero rated in future. And that is, of course, just a complete waste of time. 
because the poor people are not going to benefit from that. Because we've done this previously on paraffin. Was this, uh, that zero rated and all that happened, the paraffin price simply went up. So that zero rated simply went to the pockets of the retailers. It's going to happen the same with. Anyway, so that was one of those. And everybody cheered him, of course. All right, let's have a look, a, a look at a couple of the numbers. This is just GDP, GDP numbers uh, according to Minister of Finance, and just some numbers that I have over here. And these are all estimates and so on, and let's just go through the numbers. Economic growth for this year is expected to be 0.7% now. My number is about 0.5%. This is a bad number, people. This is a really, really bad number. And next year, I've, uh, they've got 1.7%. And the interesting thing is, when you listen to economic commentators, economists, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, it doesn't matter who you listen to. And, they, you, and you, you, you look at their estimates for economic growth going forward. It is always up. It is, it is, well, it's always up. Nobody ever predicts a recession. Only when you're there, then they, some of them do predict. But nobody will predict that we're going to see a recession next year. It never happens like that. So you can expect that to happen. Expect, and I, even I did that. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but anyway, so my, my number, I don't know what economic growth is going to be, but it seems to me as if the South African economy got stuck in a growth trajectory of about 1% or so. In a good year, we can expect economic growth of maybe 1.5% or so. In a bad year, economic growth of half a percent or so. That is more or less where we got stuck in. We, that is our, our economic growth tra trajectory. Keep in mind that population growth in South Africa is close to 2%. And uh, that, uh, I mean, simply looking at this number, these sort of numbers, economic growth, uh, it is quite clear that unemployment will go up. And we just saw what happened to unemployment yesterday. And it's very, very clear that we will see an increase in poverty as well. Keep in mind also is that there is, an, there is a degree of, there is some productivity gains as well in the economy. So if the economy grows by 1%, it doesn't mean you're going to employ 1% more people. You're going to employ fewer people because the guys that are employed, they do things better. There's an improvement in productivity. So you need to grow the economy, not at population growth, but at least a percentage higher uh, than population growth in order just to, just to accommodate the new guys that, that enter the job market. So that is, in my view, the single most important number in this country. Forget about silly things like job creation and investment summits and that sort of nonsense. Grow the economy. That's what you need to grow and all these other things will happen. Inflation numbers. Uh, the minister, I expect more or less, I uh, agree with the minister's inflation numbers, five or five, five, six percent or so. Um, it is quite possible that that number can, can, can get out of hand quite easily, but quite quickly. If, for example, there's a downgrade from Moody's, which I expect to happen, if there's a downgrade from Moody's, then we're going to fall out of these indices. That, can, that will result in, a, in an outflow of capital out of South Africa, weaker currency, higher bond rates, and so on. And that can filter through, uh, that will filter through to inflation as well. A very important reason why inflation is relatively low in South Africa is simply be, there simply isn't demand. So it's very difficult for businesses to pass on uh, uh, cost increases, uh, price increases to the consumer. That is a very important reason. And the moment there's a bit of a demand picking up in the economy, of course, we're going to see much more inflation. But all, all bad things, it always ends. If you mismanage your economy, it always ends in high levels of inflation. Now, we have a reserve bank that is that's pretty well, well managed at the moment, so they tr that's the backstop. At the moment, but I'm very, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Reserve Bank just now. But if the Reserve Bank is somebody else is put in charge of the South African Reserve Bank, be very, very worried. Okay, so inflation, it can quite easily get out of hand, uh, but for now, inflation probably going to be below 6% or so. The rand can easily go pick a number, 20 rand to the US dollar if there's a downgrade, I don't know, and that of course will filter through. Uh, to things like, for example, um, inflation. The budget deficit, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. The f budget deficit, the minister expects about 4% to GDP. Uh, my number is about 4.3%. And remember, the, f the fiscal deficit is a ratio, a ratio between the difference between state revenue and state expenditure. And of course, there are many different definitions. And relative to the size of the economy, and, uh, and of course, the, so it's the deficit and the economy that, that, that matters. And the reason why I've got a larger fiscal deficit over here has partly got to do with my expectations of weaker economic growth over there. Then the debt levels, the minister expects debt levels in, in the 23-24 at about 60% to GDP. Uh, I think the debt is probably going to be a little bit higher this year and I don't know what it's going to be in that year. I just don't know and that's part of the reason for this presentation. I'm going to give you some tools to play around with to make your own calculations to see what's going to happen to debt to GDP. Okay, there are 
some numbers on some major numbers on the economy. The Reserve Bank, one or two comments about the Reserve Bank, expect the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates. The government at the Reserve Bank, and I must tell you, I think he's, he's really, he's getting better by the day. He's quite a good guy. I think he's doing an excellent job. And by the way, I also love the comments made by Titi Mbaweni during his speech uh, in, in Parliament, the things he said about the South African Reserve Bank. So at least there's one, there's somebody in, hopefully, in Cabinet that will be a voice against the nationalization of the South African Reserve Bank. Um, so the, the Seleseche Kanyaho doing an excellent job. Let's just hope he stays there and he doesn't become the next Minister of Finance. Let's hope he stays there, but expect an increase in interest rates. Maybe just a comment there. Remember South Africa, it's not only about interest rates that we're going to increase interest rates, uh, about inflation that we're going to increase interest rates locally, uh, but we also have, simply have to follow international trends. You can go it alone a little bit, but you can't go it alone all by yourself, especially if you're a small open economy like South Africa, eventually you have to follow international trends and international interest rates are going up. And that's part of the reason why the rand has been a little bit weaker uh, of late. Um, I had a debate with um, yesterday with some colleagues of mine and they reckon why on earth would the Reserve Bank increase interest rates when the economy is barely growing, when we've got high levels of unemployment and things like that. That is not the responsibility of the Reserve Bank to grow the economy. The reserve, responsibility of the Reserve Bank is to make sure that we have sound money. And it's important to have sound money because if you have sound money, you can plan and you can do more transactions. And that is what's good for the economy, sound money, money that maintains its value. Talking about money that maintains its value, this is a calculation on, on the, the currency, the rand. Uh, above the red line means the rand is, is undervalued. Below the, rand, the red line means the rand is overvalued. There's, uh, on a, this is essentially a purchasing power parity calculation that I've done, plus some historic trends that I mix into my calculation. So if the rand is trading there, which is in today's terms about 12 rand 50 or so, then it's more or less correctly valued. So the rand should be at about 12.50 or so to the US. It is currently trading, as you all know, at about 14 or well, 14 and a half or so. So the rand is actually a little bit overdone. Um, is it going to come back? And this, is, and this model has been surprisingly accurate in the past. So when the rand was at the ridiculous levels like what we saw there, this is the, that was the, um, what crisis? That was the Asian crisis when the rand went there. There's the Rubicon crisis, by the way. So when the rand was trading there and when the rand was trading over here, and that was the financial crisis, I told the people to bring back their the, the money back to South Africa because I could see it was overdone. And fortunately for me also during the times when the rand was quite strong over there, we took a lot of money out. But at this level, I'm supposed to tell people to bring their money back. I don't do that because I simply do not have trust in the South African government and I keep on taking money out. And that's, that is my, but that's what we do. We take money, people's, people's money out and we invest it internationally. Not only because of the currency, don't try to play the currency, you're gonna get it wrong, I promise you, but because of other reasons. Like for example, internationally there are many, many thousands of stocks that I can pick from. Locally, there are basically 100 stocks that I can pick from. So it makes sense to take money out. And I keep on advising people to take a significant part of their money out. Maybe another comment about the South African Reserve Bank. They, uh, why is it that they want to nationalize the South African Reserve Bank? I don't, I can't figure it out because what is going to change? The Reserve Bank is still going to be independent, well, theoretically. And, and I don't know why they want to do that. I think the advisors don't understand economics, perhaps. But there's another reason that might be part of the reason why they want to nationalize the Reserve Bank. And is, that is that the Reserve Bank has got dollar reserves of around about $50 billion or so. And maybe just by the way, that's part of the reason why I don't believe we're going to go to the IMF for, an, for a loan. Because we have more than sufficient dollar reserves at the South African Reserve Bank to, to, to pay off or to redeem those dollar denominated uh, loans when they fall due. And they, they staggered over a long period of time. So they, we've got no, more than enough dollars. We don't have a shortage of dollars. But in South Africa, we need rands. And we've got a, a certain sh uh, a significant shortage of rands in South Africa. And you go to the IMF if you have balance of payments problems. But you go to the World Bank if you want, if you want to invest in a, some infrastructural pro um, project, as an example. And uh, so I don't think we're going to go to the International Monetary Fund for money. Because we don't need dollars. We have enough dollars. Anyway, if we borrow money from the IMF, those dollars are going to go to the, to the South African Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank will print rands and give it to whoever borrowed the money, and then they're going to drain the rands out again. So we're not going to use the money. So I can't understand 
why people say we're going to go to the IMF. Even the Minister of Finance said so, uh, or he threatened that we're going to go to the IMF. Um, anyway, so why is it that they want to nationalize the Reserve Bank? Well, because of that lot of dollars that are there, 50 billion worth of dollars. Um, and the agreement between the South African Reserve Bank and Treasury is that uh, Treasury can only use these dollars, which technically belongs to Treasury at the South African Reserve Bank, to redeem dollar-denominated loans. The, the Treasury, uh, although it belongs to Treasury, they can't use these dollars. It technically belongs to Treasury, they can only use it to redeem foreign loans. So if you take over the Reserve Bank one way or the other, you can renegotiate these agreements between the South African Reserve Bank and Treasury, and which can potentially allow politicians then lay their hands on those, on those dollar reserves and convert that into rands, because technically it belongs to Treasury. And not only that, there was a lot of revaluation of those dollars because of the depreciation in the currency. So there's a lot of book profit at the South African Reserve Bank. In total, it's an amount of about 450 billion rand that potentially can polit politicians can potentially lay their hands on. Of course, it's not going to happen, I believe, hopefully not. But that is the reason why I say things like this always ends up in inflation, uh, because politicians eventually try to take control of the central bank. There's a lot of money in the process of making money, and the Reserve Bank is where money is made. Okay, some, some other numbers. The green line in South Africa, this is just a, flow, a moving average of economic growth. The green line in South Africa, you can see South Africa's economic growth, what's been going on. The green line in South Africa's economic growth. The emerging economies over there, much higher than ours still, significantly higher than ours. And part of the reason for the slowdown, again, those are moving averages, has to do with the slowdown in China that we've seen recently, but also primarily because of regions like, for example, South America, economic growth is going down the drain. Interesting thing, the, the developed world, the rich world, the economic rate of growth is actually picking up. And of course, the, the main reason for that has to do with America. The, um, the economic growth, as we all know, is red hot. The American economy is just cooking. This is per capita GDP. And that is the, the rich world. And as you can see, the per capita GDP is about four or five times higher than what we have in South Africa. That is the per rich world. And the world, the average for the world, the green line is South Africa, and the red line is the emerging or the developing world. Now, if you zoom in a little bit, in that between South Africa and the emerging world, you can see, in a, because of the scale, you can't see it that properly or that well, but the rest of the world is catching up with South Africa and very, very fast. If you look at South Africa and compare that to, the, to, to Africa, South Africa's, at the current trajectory, South Africa's per capita GDP will converge with that of the average of sub-Saharan Africa in less than 20 years, probably around about 15 years or so. And then the, the economic incentive for people in the rest of sub-Saharan Africa to come to South Africa will cease to, to, to exist. Because why? Why come to South Africa when you can get the same sort of per capita income somewhere else? So that's a major thing. We're falling behind. There are many reasons why we're falling behind. This is a very important reason why we're falling behind. The average for, um, for the emerging economies, how much, what percentage of the economy do they invest? And they invest approximately 23% of the economy relative uh, to GDP. They invest in your economy. Remember, in order to grow an economy, you must postpone consumption. Postponement of consumption, the word for that is savings. So you must, you cannot, if you produce 100 bags or something and you consume all of that, you do not save anything. And if you don't save anything, you do not have seeds to plant next year, in simple terms. So you must postpone consumption. That is called savings. And with savings, you invest in order to create, that's capital creation, in order to create a platform for stronger economic growth going forward. Now, this is what we invest in South Africa. South Africa's investments are significantly lower than the emerging, the rest of the world and the emerging economies. And in fact, that if we want to bring it to the average of where the rest of the emerging economies are currently, we need to increase our annual uh, investments by nearly 200 billion rand annually. Sounds familiar, that number? 200 billion rand? So that's what we need to increase that by, just to get on the average where the rest of the emerging economies are. Unemployment, we all know this unemployment number. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. We all, this is a, absolutely, this is a, this is a national disaster, unemployment. And quite ironically, I don't believe we should try to address unemployment because politicians confuse keeping people busy with employing people. Those are two different things. 
real employment happens when you use your own money and you're prepared to use your own money to pay somebody else to do something for you. That is real employment. But if you use somebody else's money to pay somebody to be busy, that's not employment. So unfortunately, the politicians got it wrong. Please stop with job creation. I, 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 nobody wants to create the job. That's why we, call, why we have technology, because we want to do actually less, not more. We want to do less, not more. Job creation is a silly idea. So please stop with that. Life expectancy. Um, life expectancy, that's just the rich world, uh, about 80, 83 or so, and I made a few comments about life expectancy re uh, recently. This is South Africa, life expectancy. That is the disastrous AIDS policy of the ANC, uh, but, uh, but of course that fortunately was, was changed. Okay, some other uh, numbers. This is, the main, this is the most important number. This is just what has been happening on the state finances in the last couple of years, and I've showed this specific graph to the Free Market Foundation many, many, many times. This, this, this is fiscal policy. This, whole, this, this tells you exactly what's going on there. So the top line is just state spending, and you can see what's been happening to state spending. Look at that year there, 2008-2009. That was the financial crisis, but it was also the beginning of the Z period. Okay, So see what happened to state spending, and it just kept on going up, like no, there's no tomorrow. The blue line over there, the state revenue, taxes, the taxes roughly are back where, where it was before the financial crisis now. It just, just keeps on going up as well. I'm going to unpack that a little bit. And the gap between these two is called the fiscal deficit. And that's how, money, how much money they need to borrow. And the gap between those two, and that is that gray line over there, and I think that is the right-hand axis. This is over here. That is the fiscal deficit, what we have. Okay? All right. So that's easy. This is how much they spend relative to the size of the economy. This is how much money they get in. And I'm talking about national government. I try to, I think so. The, the main budget, yes. I try to talk about national government. There are many different definitions. What do you talk about? What's government? Is it, do you include uh, the, the, the provinces? Do you include the local authorities? Do you include ESCOM and so on and so on? No, this is not included. This is just in the so-called national or the so-called main budget. Okay, so that, that summarizes everything that's been going on in state finances. Just a few things where the, where the money is coming from, the most important revenue source. Personal income tax, by far the most important revenue source. And there are a few individuals that contribute most of all this taxes, personal income. A very tiny number of individuals. I unpack that usually during my budget analysis. So if they invite me again, I will unpack that and show you how many individuals pay that. Um, the value added tax, that's another important thing. Interesting thing about VAT, we saw VAT going up quite nicely in recent years, or quite in nominal terms, quite a nice increase in VAT spending that's been coming down recently. And that is because of the huge increases of the civil servants and they spend money and they also pay VAT. And, uh, and remember, if you pay a civil servant a lot, like what we've seen there, they also pay personal income tax, by the way. They can take their pay slip to the bank and they can borrow a lot of money to buy a flat screen TV and a Beamer. And that also contributes to value added taxes. But we've seen the end of that flick probably now because uh, banks are getting very reluctant to lend more money out. And we see the increase in uh, pr private sector credit extension around about 6% or so. So in nominal terms, that is basically keeping a lid on economic growth because the pool of money is not increasing that much. So, so that's just a, a by the way comment. That one there, corporate income tax, as far as I'm concerned, that is the best indicator of economic activity uh, because they, when the economy is not making money or when the economy is not growing, companies are not making money and they stop paying taxes. So those are the major taxes and a couple of smaller ones over there. Okay, there's a fuel levy, maybe I can just mention that. That's the fuel levy, about 6% to GDP. Just, I know many people are saying that we have to have a specific tax for something. You have to levy, like the plastic bag tax is a good one. We're going to levy a tax on plastic bags, and we're going to use this money to clean up the streets and so on. It never happens. Or we're going to levy a fuel levy, and we're going to use this fuel levy to build the roads. It never happens. It always becomes part of the pool. And eventually, they have to find another tax, like, for example, toll roads. Well, the fuel levy initially, the idea of the fuel levy initially was to, to build the roads and now, so they're privatizing a lot of taxes in a way. Okay, so that is what's been happening. Okay, just an analysis. So this is quite interesting for me. I don't know if it's going to be interesting for you. This is the budgeted estimates for the Minister of Finance on the various taxes. This is the adjusted budget for the Minister of Finance and a deviation. In the case of personal income taxes, that's going to be a bit below budget, about two billion. It's not that bad um, from a bigger picture. Uh, and I think part of th that is a reflection of weak uh, well, uh, um, employment creation in the economy. That's a very important. That's a part of the reason for that. 
Corporate in income taxes, that's, I'm very concerned about that. Corporate income taxes, I'm going to show you a graph just now. Corporate in income taxes is telling me the underlying story of what's going on in the economy, and that's weak economic activities. Value added taxes, there's an amount of about 11 billion that, uh, that the taxpayer has been supposed to be paying back to value, to uh, repayments, to or reclaims, what do you call it, repayments, to, to VAT reclaims or repayments. Um, refunds, that's the word, and they haven't been doing that. And, and that's, uh, that was quite a brave move for, I don't know who should be take the credit for that, let's give the Minister of Finance a credit for that, to repay all those uh, refunds. The previous, is he still the previous one, or is he still, he's still there? Uh, is he, has he been fired yet? Not yet. Uh, but uh, obviously what they did was to keep ba hold back those refunds on VAT. To make it appear as if tax collections are not doing that badly. So that's the main reason for that. So the under collection, actually, the underlying under connection, collection for VAT is around about 8 billion or so. And that's an indication of slowdown in demand in the economy and a couple of other taxes. So the total under collection for the minister is roughly about um, 30 billion or so. Just keep in mind, if the RAND depreciates by roughly about 10%, then we add about 30 billion to debt simply because of the, the increase in the RAND value of, of, of a foreign denom denominated debt. So it's more or less the same thing. So a weaker RAND actually adds to debt. These are the different um, taxes, the major ones. Personal income tax, contribution to total revenue, and as you can see, that's been increasing quite a lot. And of course, the trick here is not to make adjustments to the personal income tax scales and allow fiscal drag um, to, to push you up into our tax bracket. So that's a very, that's a, that's politi uh, politicians all do. This is value added tax been doing recently only have we seen value added tax coming down a bit in the indication of, of weak economic growth and of a uh, weak demand in the economy and that's corporate taxes and look at that. Actually it's a good thing. We have to get corporate, we have to, can well, as far as I'm concerned we can just as well scrap uh, corporate taxes. If other guys can do it or close to being doing it like the Irish, for example, why can't we do that? Because companies never pay tax anyway. They always shift their tax burden to individuals. So individuals always pay all taxes. But making uh, what I said earlier about transaction ta taxes, like I don't know what the answer to that is. Rather get rid of that and get rid of corporate income taxes. This is a theoretical argument and add all of that only to personal income taxes and maybe increase the number of scales, make it more um, broader. I don't know. So that's a debate. And I don't know what the answer is to that. All right. Uh, some other taxes. We know that the Ta Davis Tax Commission suggested an, uh, a so-called wealth tax, but not yet. But we're probably eventually going to, we need more money. Value added tax, I am pretty sure they're not going to touch that again. Um, the politically, that is just too sensitive. Uh, yeah, this last increase, it was sort of expected. So they did that increase. Corporate income taxes, I, uh, there, were, there are suggestions by some people that don't understand economics that we need to increase corporate income taxes. That's really a silly idea to do. I don't think they will do that. And what I've seen, if you look at this, there's something called the elasticity of tax collections. And what it has, without a doubt, what has been happening recently uh, is that people are evading taxes or avoiding taxes. Paying. That is, we have a tax revolt on our hands already. I think the toll roads is a very good example of that. Okay, that's just a few comments about some taxes. State spending, where's the money going to? I'm not going to go through everything. I just want to touch on that one over there. That is interest on state debt. It's about 11%. And that is the fastest growing item in the budget of the Minister of Finance. This is health. So interest on, on debt and health services are basically the same. With the amount of money that we spent on that. It's about 200 billion each or so. Now, it's going to increase quite, quite sharply over the next couple of years, and I'm going to show you about that. And just put it in perspective, you know, that, is, that 200 billion that we, that, that, that we pay on interest on state debt, that is the amount of money that we need in order to, to, to be able to implement the national health insurance. We need 200 billion annually. So if we haven't had the debt that we do have currently, we could have used that 200 billion and simply added. And I'm not in favor of the NHI. I'm very much against that. I'm just saying. All right, this, this graph here, interest, uh, that's on the right-hand scale. That's the red one over there. That is a percentage of total expenditure. And clearly what you can see recently from 2008 and so on. And the reason for that, we've seen a sharp increase in state debt and a, 
well, first we saw a reduction, a fall in state debt relative to the economy. So interest of state debt came down, and from 2008, 2009, it came, it, it increased quite substantially, and over the next couple of years, it's going to accelerate quite sharply. Um, and then wages is on a left-hand scale, and the reason for that is, of course, that if you had a, the, the, the increase in spending was primarily on wages and civil servants, and that's been flattish relative to the total expenses expenditure the last couple of years. Okay, that's just on that number. Um, I'm going to skip that one. That's too All right, now uh, this is just uh, debt levels. Debt levels relative to GDP is going to go to 55% of GDP. It is currently, in fact, over 50%, but this is a moving average that I'm working with here. That's why it looks like only 50%. The actual number is 55%, and debt to GDP, according to my calculations, will be going to at least 60%, and it may, in four years' time, go to 70% or so, excluding the guarantees of the state on enterprises. And the reason for that has to do, of course, with, um, uh, oh no, that's uh, economic growth. That's the red line over there. And uh, uh, there was a study done by, um, what's his name, Rogoff. He's one of the economists that this, did the study. And the conclusion in it was that when state debt relative to GDP reaches roughly 55 to 60%, then that has a significant depressing impact on economic activities. So that's the threshold, more or less, 55, 60% or so, and that's we are, where we are now. So if state debt goes up further, then it will have a significant impact on economic growth going forward as well. Um, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, to be fair, that is typical Keynesian kind of economics, what you see here. As economic growth slows down, you increase your debt. That is what uh, John Maynard Keynes told us. But of course, you have to do exactly the opposite when the economy starts growing, and we are not very good at that. But the point I'm trying to make, as debt keeps on going up, we're probably going to see a depressing effect on economic growth over time. Now look at this number. Now this is state the debt in nomin and rand terms, and the other one, the, the, the blue one, is guarantees uh, to the state on enterprises. Only utilized guarantees. Okay, now the interesting thing is, and I didn't realize this, I had a look. The, the, we've always had guarantees. The state always guarantees the state-owned enterprises. And from 1995, state guarantees to, and uh, until 2008 or 2007, around about there, state guarantees to the state-owned enterprises uh, was always about 65 billion. Uh, up and down a little bit, but that's it. So there, was no, there was no real increase, really. But look what happened. That's a blue one, to state guarantees. It, it simply exploded from, 2000, from the Z period. And of course, total state debt as well. So if you add the two together, that one over there and that one over there, then total outstanding debt by the state today is, um, is 300, uh, bill, uh, 300 trillion, 3,000 billion rand, which is uh, a lot of money. Okay, that, I think this is an important graph. We have to show this to, to anybody, everybody. Uh, uh, gross uh, fixed capital formation. Um, this is government, how much government is actually investing in the economy, around about 7-8% or so. The blue one is what the private sector is investing in the economy. The, this nonsense about the so-called um, uh, investment strike that we have, that's not the case. Uh, if, there's, if you're talking about an investment strike, it certainly is government. In this case, what I've done, I use central government and I use the public corporations, the state owned enterprises as well. So that's my definition for government as a percentage of GDP. Total investment capital formation in South Africa to GDP is uh, about 18% or so. That includes private, uh, private and government. This is this saving. Remember, it's okay to borrow money. I always tell a joke. If you borrow money uh, to build a new room for the new baby, that is fine can do that because you capital for capital is fine but if you borrow money to go to Mauritius to make the baby that's not good because <laughs> <laughs> for capital for current is not good so and this is what so what you can do you can simply see how much politicians are spending on capital and how much they are borrowing if those two are the same it's fine but if they if they spend more uh, if they borrow more than what they're actually investing on capital then they are e effectively destroying capital you are a destroyer of capital and that's what the state is doing so st stop digging, I guess, is a, maybe a, a good starting point. And if you want to stop digging, it means that just spend less on, on current expenditure, and this ratio will go up. It will look a little bit better. Okay, now this is, don't look at the whole graph. Let me just try to, the, the important point is the following, is the following. So what do we need to do? 
Currently, state debt relative to GDP is about 55, 56% or so. Now, if you want to, and if you don't do anything about that, remember the econ economy is growing at 1%. We have a fiscal deficit at 4%. Now that means relative to the economy, state debt, re and this is a bit rough because there are uh, foreign loans that is uh, affected by exchange rate and stuff like that. But the bottom line is as follows. If the economy is growing at 1%, you have a fiscal deficit of 4% to GDP, then debt to GDP will increase by 3%. And if debt to GDP increases by 3%, that is added to debt, and then you, you, the next, the year thereafter, your interest will go up by 0.4% in this example. Say half a percent. Make it round numbers. And if you wait another year, of course, now debt is higher by 3.5%. Now you've got a higher level. And what's happened, if you still have 1% economic growth and fiscal deficit of 3%, you're going to add another 3% plus, now you're going to add 0.6% interest to the higher debt level again. So the thing compounds, adds. So what do you need to do if you want to keep in a current year, if you want to keep state debt relative to GDP constant? Now the word that I like to use for that is consolidate state debt. And politicians keep on telling us, that's what I understand under the word consolidate. It means, in my book, it means things are not getting worse. Okay, that's what it means in, my, in terms of the fiscal policy. So what do you need to cut state spending in the current financial year just to make sure that state debt relative to GDP stays the same? And the answer is approximately 11.5% in nominal terms. So, if you want to maintain debt to GDP, at the current 55% to GDP, we have to cut state spending by 11.5% in nominal terms. Now, politically, that is nearly impossible. But if we wait a little bit, the year thereafter, it's going to be more. And it will increase every year by 3.5% and eventually by 4% and so on and so on. And eventually the whole thing will completely get out of hand. And this is with the assumption of 1% economic growth and a fiscal deficit of 3%. The point I'm trying to make, the longer you wait to cut back on state spending, the more difficult it's going to become to cut state spending to a level where you're going to stabilize or consolidate state, uh, state debt relative to GDP. That's the point I'm trying to make. And of course, if the economy grows at one, or to 2% suddenly, everything changes. And if you can bring down the fiscal deficit to 3% and privatize some stuff, for example, and pay off state debt, then everything changes. Or if the rent appreciates, then everything changes. So on this very basic assumption, uh, I just can't see how we are going to stabilize state debt relative to GDP. I think that's the point I want to make. Um, okay, let me, I think I'm... Okay, so how do you fix this mess? I don't think we're going to fix this mess. I really don't know how we're going to fix this mess. Politically, I don't know what's going to happen to the future of South Africa. Uh, and I don't think the A is, I, I don't, know, don't think that DA is the solution. And I don't know who the solution is. I, I really don't know. Um, there are some good things happening. Uh, things like, for example, like I've mentioned, if you are capable or, and you can identify the risks in your, in your industry, then without a doubt, you're going to make a lot of money. There are some ama amazing technological changes happening. And I had to talk about cryptocurrencies or private monies and so on. That's one example of that. We at the Efficient Group, for example, we're going to, we've created something called a note. It's like an exchange traded fund that we've listed on a JSE. And we heard yesterday, we will, as far as I know, we will be only the second company in South Africa that lists something in Zurich. And it will happen in the 21st of November. And that's another note that we're going to list there. The point is, we've got a financial instrument that we're going to list on stock exchanges, and we're going to use a so-called crypto coin to represent that. So it's like the gold standard. It's the gold standard. So those are exciting stuff that is happening. But if I, if I uh, were to advise the president on what to do, I would advise him just, I can remember when I was, when I was in my early 20s, I didn't like myself. And that is one important lesson when I get the opportunity to speak to kids, especially. The, the most important thing to do is that you have to, you have to like yourself. With that, I don't mean think you're the best, and that's not what I mean. But you're going to live with yourself for a very long time. So, and if you don't like yourself, it's, gonna be a, <laughs> it's not going to be nice. So like yourself. That's a very important um, thing to do. And I can remember 
one of a way to get out of depression or a way of getting sort of get a feeling of I can actually achieve something is to complete something. And what I did as a young man is to read a book. Because you get this feeling I've achieved something. I started the book and I've completed the book. It's not difficult. And you feel good because you've completed something. Now my advice to the president is just do something and just do something well. Really anything. Just do something well. And I think something that we all will agree on to, that he can tackle, which is possible to do, and we all, I'm absolutely convinced, will support him 100% is to fix something and do something well, is to fix our traffic. Just fix, the, there's nothing to do with the economy. It's a so-called broken window kind of approach. Just fix the traffic. I'm sure we can fix the traffic. And in a, say in a year's time, we're going to halve the deaths on the roads. Fix the traffic. That's an easy thing to do. We should be able to do that. And of course, start where it really matters. And it starts with the local authorities. It doesn't matter to have a high poly international investment conference. What happened, what is, what is important to make sure that you, where it really matters, where those small moms and pop shops are, that they can make a success. They must have electricity. They must have infrastructure. They must have all these sort of things. And that means the local authorities must be fixed. That must be your priority number one. Of course, there are many other things like education and so on. But in the short term, that's what you must do. And of course, fix the state-owned enterprises. Close South African Airways down. Don't overrule the boards if they, if they do what they're supposed to be doing. And if we can do these things, just get something right and just fix something, I am sure that we might be able to turn things around. But as things stand at the moment, I am very concerned about the future for South Africa. And what I'm particularly concerned about is that I can sense this tension building up the social and political tension building in, uh, up in South Africa, and how people don't listen to each other anymore, but how we scream at each, uh, at each other, and how we're pointing fingers at each, uh, at each other. And I'm afraid that is one of those things that, if, as, as a country, what we really need is political leaders that get us to talk to each other again and not to point fingers anymore, like what we're doing currently. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay. Yeah, are there any questions? I'm happy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's. Donny, um, I've always been led to believe that to not destroy jobs, you must have growth of maybe two, two and a half percent. Now, the current figures we had out yesterday suggesting on a narrow basis 27 percent unemployment. Yeah. Um, and yet we've been deep in either um, recession territory for a while or significantly lower than two, two and a half percent growth. What I'm asking you is this, when I mean, you alluded to it, when you said government's kind of just keeping people busy rather than giving themselves jobs. Is the difference between what, what should be destroying jobs, even from these very, very elevated levels, um, things like the extended public works program, for example? Is, is that a good thing? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's in, and that's what politicians don't understand. We have to understand that this wonderful, this amazing thing that we call the economy is, is a thing, it's a process. It's a process and all sort of things happen continuously. And the best way that this thing can work and this organism can function is to, to, to let it be. Because the moment you start trying to, the only reason why it's wonderful to live, the only reason why it's wonderful to live is because you can die. There is no other reason. <laughs> That's why life is wonderful. And that's why the economy works. It only works well and it only grows and it creates a lot of wealth if we also allow it to fail, fail in inverted commas. So we must allow businesses to fail. We must allow jobs to be destroyed. We must allow this thing to evolve into something else. Because the moment you start to try to prevent those things that in your view are bad things, then you're also going to, uh, to, make, uh, to put a, uh, an obstacle in the way of the so-called uh, good things. So if you think you're going to create hate jobs, you are completely missing out on this whole thing. You have to allow this amazing organism to run by itself. And in a process, it's not going to be plain sailing for everybody. It's going to, a lot of people will get hurt in the process as well. But that's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the beast. And I'm afraid politicians don't see it that way. Yes, uh, John. So, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, John, before you. A key part of your presentation focused on the rising level of, of debt. Yes. And 
uh, I read an interesting article in, in, in the situation in the United States, and they're also concerned with their rising level of debt. Yes. And they came up with an interesting way of presenting the statistics so people could understand it. Yes. Everyone is familiar with the uh, Tax Freedom Day, which is a day yes. where you've paid your taxes and then thereafter you, you, you can, the rest of the money is your own. Um, this author came up with the concept of the, the Deficit Day, which is the day in the United States where um, the government runs out of tax revenue and has to borrow to meet its government expenditure. Nice idea. It's, and, and the, 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 That's the, wonderful the idea. figure for the United States was that the 19th of October, they a week money. back, they ran out of money. And from now on, they, they, they're spending amazing. on their credit card. So that's well, a, yeah, that's a wonderful. I, I will so do that. It's a very simple calculation to do. Yeah, I guess I, I yeah good idea. It, but I only read the article this afternoon, so I couldn't do the calculation. That's right. amazing. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do the calculation. Maybe just a comment about the U.S. economy. That's a, a wonderful suggestion. Uh, so calculate for until what time of the year do they actually spend tax money, and thereafter they start spending borrowed money. Is it like spending your groceries? On, yeah. on, 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 on your, your house bond. Yes, yeah. Or going to Mauritius thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, but but uh, just a comment about the U.S. economy. Remember, the Americans are really different. And they are different because they are the, they've got the world's currency. They trade in, they can, they can pay off their own debts by simply printing more money. We can't do that. Uh, and until that, until the world changes and we start using some other currencies as the world's most important reserve currency, they will have this amazing benefit. Um, and and, 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 and it, this is not going to change soon uh, because you, you don't only need a currency. Everybody says, let's stop using the American dollar and use something else. That's not going to happen because it's not only a currency that you need. You need something behind that. You need especially a capital market behind that because you have dollars. You can take your dollars and you can buy um, U.S. Treasury bonds, for example. You can't buy remember, remember Treasury bonds because you're not allowed to. So it's not only a matter of deciding we're going to use something else. There's also much more than... I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, John. Bobby, do you anticipate that they're going to try and force through national health insurance in this climate? No, I believe not anymore. I think um, Aron Matswaneni, he would have tried to do that because he's, he's not concerned about where the money comes from. But I really do think that the new Minister of Finance is, is at least going to sort of be a bit of a, a drag on this. I don't think it's going to happen. It, it, we just do not have the money. I, I really do think T2 is the, probably the best choice that it could have been. No, I don't think it's going to happen. Not soon. But there's, there's, there's no money. There's one way of doing it, it's simply forcing the private sector to participate in that, which is nothing but a tax. Uh, but not in a current, as, as I understand, the plans that they have for the NHI, it simply will not be implemented. Yes, sir. Darby, when you're looking at the state guarantees, I was in the Ministry of Finance in 1995, yes. and we kept strict control over guarantees. How much of the guarantees that you're talking about on your graph are already, in inverted commas, financed by banks where they've covered losses that they haven't called on the state? Because I'm very concerned that we, we, we could have a big balloon of massive losses that are funded by banks purely on the basis oh. of government guarantees. Uh, the, and I'm I, not sure yeah. that that, that yes. debt, which is really accumulated losses, has been brought into account in your graph of... No, it's not included. So well, what you're saying is a non-guaranteed debt. Well, no. It, what it is, it's a loss that has been guaranteed by government, but not called upon by government to stomp up the, the money. Um, my suspicion is I'm not too concerned about that. And the reason why I'm not too concerned about that is because of how conservative our banks are. And the... the the point. Is it? Am I? Because if the banks call up the money, it, it's a way of hiding state-owned enterprise losses. Okay. You don't bring them into account in the Ministry of Finance. Oh, I see. So you lost all this money and you've covered it up because I wrote a guarantee. Oh, yes. and, and the financial market is accepting it. Well, we've got X amount of guarantees. Yeah. I've said, well, that is what's funding the losses because if you didn't have the guarantee, the banks would never have funded the losses. Yes. So we would have then had action much quicker. Yes. So we've got a system that allows, because the banks allow the borrowing for losses, which you wouldn't do to any private enterprise. You allow the losses to be covered by guarantee. But you haven't called the guarantee out. Yes. So you've got a sort of, like it's a contingent liability. But it yes. isn't a contingent liability. It's an actual debt 
that's owed to the banks? Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. The biggest one, of course, is Eskom. Mm -hmm. And I will go and have a look at that. And uh, that I think that information should be ready. Uh, Leon, do you want to add to that? Yes, I, I didn't want to look around and see whether it is because it's rude. But uh, <laughs> uh, if I can just add to that, the U.S. subprime crisis arose because there were so-called implicit guarantees. In other yes. words, the, the government would fund the debts of Freddie and Fannie and Jenny and others. Now, in South Africa, we assume that a government guarantee is an explicit guarantee. And I want to know from you and others here, why is that? Surely every single state-owned enterprise, if we yes. were the board of a bank and uh, a state-owned enterprise in an Excel or somebody wants to borrow from us, we would assume the government is backing it. So in other words, you aren't all state enterprises, local government in all its forms, and state enterprises, in fact guaranteed by the government for all their debt, yes. whether explicit or implicit. Yes. Now that to me is the massive understatement of yes. government exposure. Yes, and one way of fixing that is to allow one of these major state owned enterprises to really go bankrupt and let a lot of people burn. Yes. So they can learn a lesson. Yes, I agree with you. So you don't have to have a state guarantee to have a state guarantee. It's yeah. sort of implied. It's implied. For yes. every state, uh, and look, every, every organ of state is presumed to have but, a state but guarantee. But it's easy for us to say that. But imagine that you actually enforce this on the BBS bank. Yeah. Now, because there is a state guarantee. The Reserve Bank guarantees that to 100,000 for individuals. But that is essentially is a state guarantee. So imagine a lot of grannies losing their money, that's going to be tough even for a free marketeer like you, Leon. <laughs> yes, sir. Apps are currently offering 13% on a fixed deposit. Who? Apps Bank. Yes. Do they have a different view of the future? How can they offer what is the period for that? more than you can borrow? Sorry? What is the period for that? One year. Five years. Five years. <laughs> okay, I don't really know, but there's just a comment that I want to make about uh, there's a difference between lending making a deposit at the bank and lending money to a bank. And quite a lot, quite often people say that, listen, I can get so much from APSA, um, which is true, but you have to, you have to differ differentiate between whether it's a deposit or a loan to the bank. Because they stand, in, it's, if, you, if the bank, should, and I'm not suggesting anything about APSA, but if the bank should go under, then uh, the, uh, the deposit, depositors stand in front of the queue before uh, the lenders to the bank. Yeah, yeah, um, is, so that's where they, they surprise. There's a difference in that as well. Yeah. But how they got that, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, do they expect then interest rates to go up? Because yeah. otherwise they're going to make the loss. There's their answer. Somebody yeah. answer to that. I Why so? Know. Yes, ma'am. If you listen to Aris Gia, you will know that they discussed it quite extensively. And they said that <clears throat> the five-year period is not um, compounded interest, it's only interest paid oh, at yes. the end, and it's in actual fact, it's only 11%. Oh, there you are. Oh, okay, it's marketing. Yeah, it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Tell me, um, the, this SAA uh, behemoth at the moment, your opinion that there's talk now the government saying it'll cost more to get rid of SAA than to try and keep it, is that an underfunded pension schemes, or where is this? <laughs> hidden cost. Like, like, uh, the figure I sort of heard was 60 billion to shut SAA down. Yes, that's poli 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 politics speak. I think uh, you ask what the, how much it's going to cost to, to close it down. You know, if, if SAA is bankrupt and it, well, it, does, it doesn't need to say, it cost us anything. Uh, us, I mean. Us, the taxpayer. No, I mean, I, I mean Except the for the guaranteed part. But it doesn't need to cost us anything. We simply close it down and the creditors must take the knock. But if you want to stand in for a guaranteed part, I don't know what the guaranteed part is. I guess about 20... Is it 11 billion only? So that's the loss, not 60 billion. This is the question of, is it implicit? Yeah, exactly. In other words, would the government really not uh, pay uh, uh, city bank? Uh, For instance. Uh, right. So it depends on what you, how much of this debt you're going to repay. The guaranteed part, if somebody says it's 11 billion, that you will have to repay, but the rest, I don't know. And the big one is the uh, aeroplane leases. Too, but that's for that, That's the huge debt. But again, people are assuming that it's implicitly guaranteed yeah. by the government, and that's the 50 billion or something. But the minister said yes. It's also yes. guaranteed by the asset itself. Yeah, no, it's not an asset. It's a, it's a lease. It's a lease. <laughs> but, but the lender would have a 
No, the lender doesn't want the plane. It can't be <laughs> let. No, no, these are, these are valueless airplanes, essentially. <laughs> Um, and just going back to the interest rate that apps are from VBS, apparently they've got an even better interest rate. They had a what? <laughs> For their fixed deposit. Now, if you put money in VBS now, then I think they're offering 20%. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to identify your risks. Yes, uh, yes, Ian. You said you couldn't, you couldn't believe that there would be a, an ongoing attempt to nationalize the Reserve Bank. No, no, I think there will be at least a bit of a, a voice. Uh, arguing against that, so that's the thing, yes. What I think it will happen is that as part of the team asked to say what would it cost to fulfill all the promises, the election promises that were made by various political groupings, the, the red colored chap said, we, we'll spend all the money that the, that the public sector has, then we'll take everything from the private sector. After all, they took it from us, we'll take it back. <laughs> this was said by a very responsible sort of person, I thought so. What will you do in the next the next year? Oh, we'll go to Reserve Bank. They print money, don't they? <laughs> now, it is because of that belief, and you, you laugh at it, yeah. but it's widespread, and amongst the most educated of people, it's assumed. All you have to do is ask, and you know, and go around the back door, and they'll print as much as you need. Yeah. That, that, that is something where I would suggest you need, should, you missed your vocation, you should be there teaching basically economics rather than practicing it. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Uh, it's just by the way, I've done a calculation, and I can't remember, I think it's 1980 to today. I've calculated how much value the rand has lost. Now, we're all quite um, supportive of the Reserve Bank, rightfully so, and think the Reserve Bank is only doing well, and mostly they are doing more or less okay. But the Reserve Bank is the reason why the rand has lost since 1980, if I remember correctly, to today, more than 99% of its value. You cannot believe it. More than 99% of its value. And it's only the Reserve Bank because they're in charge of that. It's because of inflation. Well, because of money printing. If you make more money, then money loses its value. It's as simple as that. And eventually we call it inflation. Inflation, remember, there are two definitions for inflation. A continuous increase in the prices of most goods and services. Uh, the other definition I prefer to use is the continuous fall in the value of your currency. That is a better definition for inflation, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, are we, are we done? Yeah. Again, thank you for listening to me. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Darby's not disappointed, I shouldn't think. Uh, us, he's entertained and, and edified. And uh, thanks again for Darby. He's always a popular visitor at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, he did say that if we invite him back, he'll say something else. I can't remember what it was, uh, but we'll invite him to say whatever it was. Uh, so thanks for your attendance, and thanks again to Darby for another tour de force. Uh, great analysis, uh, informative, uh, erudite, educational, and, and I agreed with pretty much everything he said, which means that objectively he was right. <laughs>